Fantastic. Uh, thank you for everyone for being here today. Uh, we're excited for this edition of Post-Secondary Pathways, uh, Expanding the Circle, Indigenous Student Access and Persistence in Higher Education. Uh, we'll give um, audience members about two minutes uh, to log in. Uh, so we'll give everyone about two minutes and then we'll get started. For those of you who are just joining us, thanks again uh, for logging on for this edition of Post-Secondary Pathways. We'll give folks another 30 seconds or so, uh, and then we'll get started. All right, uh, thank you for again, everyone, for joining us today on this Tuesday, April 12th, uh, for this edition of Post-Secondary Pathways. Um, this is our higher ed version of uh, webinars for the Hunt Institute, so we're excited uh, to have you all with us today. Uh, our topic is Expanding the Circle, Indigenous Student Access and Persistence in Higher Education. Um, we know that Indigenous students are a demographic group that have consistently been underrepresented at institutions of higher education. Uh, and so we're excited to talk about how we can better support and uplift uh, these great students. Before we dive into our panelists, we've got four amazing panelists with us. I want to first turn the floor over to Emily Chavis, who is a research analyst on our early childhood team at uh, the Hunt Institute, and Jameson Lowry, who is a Belk Impact Fellow uh, and has been working with the higher education team. Uh, so with that, Jameson, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Dicker. Um, like he said, uh, my name is Jameson Lowry. I'm currently one of the Bill Impact Fellows uh, helping out at the Hunt Institute with their higher education team. I'm also a graduate student uh, currently pursuing my master's um, in higher education administration, and I'm just very happy to be able to be here with you all and uh, get us started with everything. Um, before I think to kick things off, uh, I would like to start us off with a land acknowledgement, um, specifically to for this area that we're in. The land that we are speaking from today is the ancestral land of many indigenous tribes, uh, with Raleigh itself sitting on the border of Tuscarora and Suwon territory, with Catawba tribes also being stewards of this particular area. Over the past 1400 years, this area was used for family life, nourishment, justice, ceremony, and healing. And for the past 500 years, Native American communities from this region and across North Carolina have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of sustained displacement and removal. Today, it is recognized that North Carolina is a broad contemporary indigenous area, being home to the Coheri, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Halawa Saponi, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of Saponi Nation, Saponi, and Wakamasuan peoples with Native Americans living in all 100 counties of the state. I would like to end this uh, land acknowledgement just as a kind of a, a drive for folks to continue to help out and support indigenous communities um, who continue to display lots of resilience uh, continuously every day. And then I'll switch it, turn it over to uh, Emily Chavis. Thank you so much, Jameson, for that land acknowledgement. Um, um, my name is Emily Chavis, and uh, as Dr. Decker said, I am a research analyst on the early childhood team. I'm also a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. And um, I'm really excited about this webinar today because as a recent college grad, um, two years now, um, Finding community on um, 
at institutions of higher education was something that was like a main priority for me, trying to find people who knew what it was like to be indigenous and be indigenous on um, university campuses, because it's not always easy. And so finding community is was one of the main ways that I stayed grounded in college and um, graduate school. And so before starting this presentation, it's important to provide some context to terminology often used for indigenous people. And the indigenous people of the Americas are a diverse people who come from many different backgrounds and have different practices and customs. There are over 600 different tribes across what is now known as the United States with each group possessing unique cultures and identities. Thus, it is important to acknowledge that indigenous people are not a monolith. The terms American Indian, Native American, Indigenous, and Native are acceptable and often used interchangeably in the United States. And Indigenous, indigenous people from Hawaii are usually referred to as Native Hawaiians. Um, and just first and foremost, also when you're referring to someone individually, it's um, usually best practice to ask them what their preference is, because uh, sometimes most people will prefer tribal affiliation first. Um, such as myself, like I would prefer Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina first as an individual. So just be best practice, a personal recommendation. Um, and so I'll turn it back over to Jameson. Thank you for that, Emily. And so to be able to provide a little bit of context for uh, today's webinar and, and why we're talking about the issues that we are, um, as Dr. Decker said, uh, Native American students are a demographic group that has consistently been underrepresented in institutions of higher education in the United States. And so despite uh, tremendous growth in enrollment for these students in recent years, um, they are still uh, underrepresented compared to other subgroups. Uh, and this is due in part to the distinct barriers uh, they have to access, um, as well as uh, due to aspects of their identity that indigenous students hold that kind of clash with Western culture. So today's session will focus on the various factors that affect Indigenous students access and persistence to these institutions. And each of the resource experts today has some background with working with this population and their work examines what supports Indigenous students need to be successful in these environments. As stakeholders, policymakers, and leaders at these institutions, we should consider the role that Indigenous students play in attainment goals and workforce development. In order to do this, it's critical to understand the history, policy landscape, and innovative practices behind supporting these students. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Decker, who will be moderating this section. Thanks, Jameson, and thanks, Emily. Uh, we really appreciate that opening. Um, and for our audience, we hope that this helps center uh, our work in uh, the student voices that really um, we're here to support and to represent. Uh, we've got a great set of four panelists, so I wanna dive right into that. Uh, and take no more time away from them. So first we'll go to Dr. David Lassner. Uh, president Lassner is the system president for the University of Hawaii and serves as the state's higher education executive officer. President Lassner, first off, thank you for being here today. Can you talk to us more about the University of Hawaii's commitment to sustainability and how it's related to becoming a model for indigenous serving universities? I think you're muted, President. Thanks, boy, what a way to start the day. Um, the University of Hawaii Board of Regents was actually one of the very first in the country to formally embrace sustainability in our mission statement. Um, but that actually came several years after the board formally embraced our commitment to do better as an indigenous serving university. I've been in this job about eight and a half years. And since I've been doing it, I've come to realize the, um, the deep, deep interconnectedness of what may have appeared to be two distinct actions by our regents and aspects of our mission uh, as they were responding to interests in the institution. So one of the ways I think about this, um, the population of Hawaii today is about 1.4 million. Uh, we have about five to 10 days of food uh, on the islands where that dependent on the outside uh, we have uh, a water supply on our most populated island is at risk, not because of drought, surprisingly, but because of fuel leaks from a World War II era wartime 
a fuel storage facility that has not been maintained or operated properly. Um, we're facing a month or so ago, we had a home literally fall onto the beach uh, because of the impacts of climate change. Um, in contrast, before Western Contact, it's estimated that there were 800,000 or perhaps a million Hawaiians living self-sufficiently across the, these islands. So it wasn't much less than we have today. And they had this figured out completely for a very large population. So while very few would advocate a return to those days, there are so many lessons uh, from that past and how to live more harmoniously, more sustainably within our environment. Um, Hawaiians viewed stewardship of the environment from the perspective of an ahupua'a, we might think of that as a watershed today, but from the tops of the mountains where the water was collected from rainfall, streams ran through the valleys and were used to create terraces in which taro was cu cultivated as the primary starch. The water continued to flow down for other crops into the ocean where fish ponds provided protein along with some of the mammals that were brought by the original Polynesian settlers. Um, and, and those are the kinds of lessons that we're, um, as a community, not just Hawaiians, but Hawaii, figuring out again today. Um, it's, it's pretty timely this morning, um, Hokulea, which is our traditional Polynesian voyaging canoe launched on the first leg of a voyage to Tahiti uh, that will be navigated without GPS, without sextant, without compass, using only the knowledge of the stars, the waves, the winds, the sky, the birds to sail over 2,500 miles. And this knowledge was almost lost from the planet until about 50 years ago. It was actually recovered from uh, the last of the Micronesian master navigators and young Hawaiians really picked it up. And what we see today is that Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians alike take great joy and pride in celebrating the amazing accomplishments of these people. They were the best navigators, the best voyagers, the best astronomers in the world. They sailed purposefully across the largest ocean in the world, centuries ahead of the Western captains who were uh, wandering the seas with instrumentation. So let me close by saying that when all of us embrace these wisdoms of the past, we see how we can do better today. Um, we instill pride within all Hawaiians who may not know this rich history and wisdom of what their ancestors knew and did. And we educate our entire community to appreciate the knowledge and practices of the host culture of our islands. Thank you for that, President Lassner. Um, and the, that wisdom, embracing the, the wisdom of the past. I really appreciate that. Uh, We'll go to our next panelist now. Uh, Jason Pacano is the Assistant Director for Student and Community Engagement, as well as currently serving as the Interim Executive Director for the Harvard University Native American Program. Uh, Jason, would you mind telling us more about your role at Harvard and how the Native American Program is important to the culture of an elite institution like Harvard? Sure, thank you. Uh, first off, Dashkaja Hani Nidosh, we help my case. My name is Jason Pacano. Uh, I'm Mandan Hidatsa Rikara, which is the three affiliated tribes out of North Dakota. And I also come from New Mexico um, on my mother's side, who is from the Pueblos of Jemez and Laguna. Um, I work here out at Harvard University um, in the Native American program um, in two roles right now, so I'm quite busy. <laughs> um, but essentially what the mission of our office is, is to elevate and promote um, indigeneity across our campus. We're situated um, within the office of the president and the provost. So some of what we deal with or some of the, some of the aspects of the university and campus life that we uh, interact with is recruitment and admissions. And so that's where my assistant director role comes in. Um, I work very closely with all of our admissions offices on campus having 13 schools. That means the college and all of our graduate and professional schools. Um, and then in the community engagement portion of my work, uh, what I do is I network across the entire university. Being situated centrally uh, at Harvard kind of gives me a, a chance and opportunity to play in different sandboxes across the university. And in doing so, you know, our primary goal is to elevate indigenous voices. And we're uniquely sort of situated to do that because Harvard um, in its um, very early beginnings had an Indian college. Um, Harvard started in 1636. Um, 
and John Harvard is probably the name most people associate with the beginning of the university or the college at that time. Um, but like any other sort of startup, they had some hiccups. And it wasn't until um, about 10 or 15 years later that President Dunster decided to reorganize and redraft the charter of our institution. And in doing so, he um, very explicitly, it's not a very long document, he very explicitly said that Harvard is here for the education of English and Indian youth. Um, part of that was the Puritan sort of ethic at the time in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, but what it did was it deliberately placed us into the history and into the, the founding really essentially of, of our current institution. Um, and so as the Native American program, we're kind of keenly aware that, that indigeneity or indigenous people, whether they're students, faculty or staff, are really um, the raw material that really makes up Harvard. Um, and so in a sort of, sort of self-proclaimed way, our office really is here to, to elevate those voices, um, is, there, is here to make sure that indigenous ways of thinking, indigenous ways of knowing are, um, are supported, our practice here. Um, you know, we are highly involved um, with students on an everyday level as they go through each of their degree programs. And in doing so, um, you know, we, we have to, in a way, really kind of be there for our students um, at, all, at all matters of, of their sort of educational life here at Harvard. Um, you know, one thing, some of the things that we do are things that are like very student affairs related. Some things are very um, financial <laughs> obligation related. Um, some things we do are very social or mental health related. Um, so, you know, our, 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 our whole approach is very holistic and that we really want to support all students and also support sort of all aspects of, of, of who they are. I think we've heard multiple times the word community. And I think that's probably gonna be a word we're gonna hear a lot today. Community is very, I think, important to our students. Our students come from very strong community bases. And so that is reflective in sort of their skill set. And I think it's a skill set that is, is something that American institutions have not yet tapped into. Um, and that's something that we want to do because we feel like an indigenous sort of grounding is really kind of where we can go as American institutions and in knowing that we have a community of folks that we bring together as scholars, as faculty, as students, as staff. Um, and that if we can really approach this from sort of an indigenous perspective, um, uh, we can, you know, we can have really great outcomes. Great. Thank you for that, Jason. And uh, thank you for all the work uh, that you're doing at Harvard. Um, next, we want to bring in President Sinaway into the conversation. Uh, president Carlos Sinaway is the, the president of Saginaw Chippewa Tribal College located in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Uh, president Sinaway, thanks for being here. Can you tell us a little more about uh, Saginaw Chippewa Tribal College and what it means to be a president of one of the country's 32 tribal colleges? Sure. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to the panel. I think one of the biggest things about being the president of the college um, is it's an extension of the community as was stated before as community is a, a big part of tribal colleges. Mount Pleasant is in the central Michigan University or is in central Michigan. And so part of that is where the tribe base is at because it kind of goes out um, throughout Michigan through the thumb area and things. So being central to the need of those, those natives that are in the community. We were chartered in 1999 and we were fully accredited in 2007. And the goal of the college at the time was to pro provide an access to higher education to the tribal membership, to native people in the community. And so that was a charge that they gave the college. And I think that part of that comes from the obvious that the, a lot of the tribal members weren't seeking higher education. And so this was the opportunity for a lot of those students to step out into a new arena that they weren't familiar with. And so what the, the tribal colleges were able to do is becoming that extension from the community, it was a place of familiar familiarity. It was a place of um, an extension of the community. And I think that was, that's key in what tribal colleges do today. They're part of the community and they keep connected to the community. And they, that's what keeps, I think, our students grounded in being um, able to be successful in, in, in higher education. So those are some things that I think are 
are really important about a tribal college. For us, I think that it's important to remember that those students probably wouldn't go to the local university and didn't go to the local university because they there wasn't that from that feeling of home or that feeling of extension, even though it was in the community. And so that's something that I think the tribal colleges are able to do is to give that sense of community and sense of home to our students that choose to come to tribal colleges. So I think that that's probably one of the, the more important things of being a tribal college president is how do you keep that connection with the community? And how do you make sure that your college stays connected to the community? Because if you start pulling away from the community, then you're gonna start pulling away from those students in their homeland, those students in their identity, those students in what they're familiar with. So I think that that's probably one of the key things about being a tribal college president is keeping your, keeping your institution grounded in the community. Uh, many of the community, many of the tribal colleges are, are extensions of that community, but some of them are even the central point of the community. When COVID hit, they became a central point. And that's who some of the communities look to for leadership. So I think it's it's some it's a it's more of a it, maybe it's a vehicle that helps communities um, stay focused, a vehicle that helps them move forward, and a vehicle that gives them a, another chance at their own livelihood and how to how to expand their growth as a community, um, as individuals. So I think that it, as a tribal college president, you have to keep a lot of things in perspective and on and watching such as your students, your administration and the bottom line. So you have to be um, able to look at all aspects of, of the college because it's, it's in a community that you have to stay connected to. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, between creating a sense of belonging for the students but also the greater uh, community impacts. And I think we all started to see uh, institutions, higher education, uh, their importance to the community when uh, COVID hit. So uh, thank you for naming uh, that for us, President Sinaway. Our fourth uh, and final panelist, last but certainly not least, uh, is Chancellor Cummings uh, from right here in uh, the great state of North Carolina. Uh, Chancellor Cummings, thank you for being here with us today. Um, Chancellor Cummings serves as the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Uh, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke hosts the distinction of being the only state designated historically American Indian University in North Carolina. Uh, Chancellor Cummings, can you speak to us briefly about th this history and the role it plays in supporting Indigenous students in North Carolina today? When thank you and thank you to the Hunt Institute for the opportunity to participate in this, this session. I really feel honored listening to the uh, three speakers before me and um, hearing all the great, great things that are happening across the nation. I, um, I have fond memories of my visit, uh, David, to Hawaii, and I hope I get there uh, again one day. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, Jason, one of the more proud moments of my life was being up at Harvard and for a, um, a session and uh, walking the quad and seeing the history of the university and, and realizing the importance of native people to the very beginning of Harvard was just uh, something I did was not aware of and, and uh, walked away so proud and I've used that in so many examples of inspiration to our Indian kids here at UNC Pembroke. So my wife and I, Rebecca, are, are members of the Lumbee tribe. The Lumbee tribe is a, a tribe of a, of a, a state recognized tribe of 60,000 uh, members and was federally recognized in 1956 by Congress, but in name only. And the law specifically denied the tribe uh, other benefits of, uh, of then recognized um, tribal members of the, of the uh, tribes of the, of the US. And that's been a, a battle which has continued to today to correct that. Um, so UNC Pembroke started in 1887. We are the third oldest uh, institution of higher education in the state of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Obviously in the 1700s, Federal State, uh, which is a historically black university was second. UNC Pembroke third, March 7th, 1887. And interestingly, 
a historically American Indian university. So North Carolina had a, an auspicious start with its uh, uh, endeavors into the area of higher education. Um, we just celebrated our 135th anniversary. We originally were named the Croatan Normal School, normal school being a, a school to teach teachers. The university started in uh, around 1885. The, the beginnings of it uh, was a conversation with seven Lumbee men who decided that education was important to the, as I said, the next seven generations of, of their children. And they approached a local white legislator uh, who had just recently been elected to the North Carolina General Assembly and Hamilton McMillan agreed to take their voice to the state capitol Raleigh and petition to have a school specifically designated to uh, train and teach or train teachers who would then uh, go out and teach the local American Indian uh, uh, students. And so that happened March 7th, uh, 1887, and Hamilton came home with $500, which was quite a bit of money back in that time. So Hamilton he, he very effectively made his argument. He was a historian and he was convinced that the Lumbee tribe descended from John White's lost colony, mixing with the Croatan normal, Croatan Indians at that time, thus the name of, it, of the uh, institution, Croatan Normal School. Since that time, we've, been, uh, we've become the um, most diverse campus, according to US News World Report in, uh, in the Southern US. Uh, on our campus, you're gonna see uh, 12, to, depending on what year, 12 to 15% American Indian students, um, a significant number of Caucasian students, 30% African American students, and a growing population of Hispanic students, and as well an international student. So we're very, very proud. Of, uh, of where we were, where we've come from, and uh, where we've gotten to. Uh, we share the distinction, as Wynn said, of being designated by the legislature as North Carolina's historically American Indian University. And we also have the distinction of being the only, or the first, yeah, the only four year public accredited university, which was established primarily or solely through American Indian efforts, specifically to teach American Indians. And up until the 1950s or so, you actually had to be a, uh, recognized as an American Indian to even attend uh, what was then Pembroke State College. And uh, that was changed obviously, obviously with the segregation and now we've grown into a very diverse, diverse campus. But we continue to uh, be a significant part of the UNC system. The UNC system is uh, 240,000 students, 15 four-year universities and uh, UNC Pembroke uh, is, a, is a very proud partner and by that association we've been able to bring quite a bit to, uh, to our students and to our campus. One of my goals at, when I took over as chancellor seven years ago was to uh, inculcate and instill in the, in the very environment of the, uh, of the campus the American Indian heritage. Not that it had been lost or denigrated, I just don't think it had been instilled and solidified to the to the point that I thought it it deserved, and so over the last four years, one one of my initial actions was to establish an office which would report to me the the uh, uh, liaison who would be in charge of Native American recruitment and retention. We've established a Native American American Indian Heritage Center on campus. We've adopted through the Board of Trustees a land acknowledgement. We've uh, also began to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day in October, as many others have. We have an annual powwow, which is growing and becoming more and more popular among all of our students here on campus. We uh, have a museum of the Southeast American Indians. Uh, our Native, we have a Native American series, speaker series, and recently, that just this year, we had Tommy Orange here on campus, uh, author of There There and more recently, Angeline Boulay, who um, uh, uh, has received quite a bit of attention from her book, Firekeep, The Firekeeper's Daughter. So long story short, when as we've done a lot to recognize our heritage, to instill it, we now also have a required requirement for any student who comes to UNC Pembroke. And if you graduate from here during your four year, five year, six year period here on campus, you have to take some course related to American Indian culture, uh, literature, and so forth. And um, 
And one, one other final uh, fact that I'll, I'll bring up that I think that we've done here at UNC Pembroke to, to hold the banner in terms of American Indian education is to establish a one and a half million dollar endowed professorship, which everyone, by the way, is empty and we are recruiting for that position. Should you know anyone who you would like to refer our way, I would love to uh, have the opportunity to review that application. And so a lot of, a lot of good things have gone on here, but UNC Pembroke has a very strong heritage and one that we want to uh, see to continue. Uh, we are really um, uh, an institution on the East Coast that we hope over time will develop into uh, one of the recognized resources for higher education for American Indians east of the Mississippi. And that's a long-term goal that we stated and hope to fulfill. Enjoy, I appreciate being part of this uh, uh, session today. Thanks so much for that, Chancellor Cummings, and uh, for all that context and uh, the work you're doing. We really appreciate uh, your partnership and your continued efforts. Um, I do want to remind the audience that we have a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom uh, chat. So uh, please feel free to use that to submit any questions you might have. Um, and then panelists, I have one additional question for each of you. We'll try to keep these to two to three minutes so that we make sure we have time for uh, some questions from the audience. But President Lassner, I want to come back to you. You, you started to touch on some of the unique needs uh, and unique uh, situations that uh, Native Hawaiians uh, feature or um, have to deal with that we might not necessarily think of on uh, the mainland. And so can you tell us more about how uh, the needs of Native Hawaiian students differ than non-Native students and what your institutions are doing to address those needs? Sure, thanks. Um, it, it's interesting as a system, our Native Hawaiian enrollment actually exceeds the percentage of Hawaiians in the overall population. It's about 29% compared to about 22% of Hawaii's uh, population. But that said, we're not where we need to be at our um, globally recognized flagship research university, UH Manoa. Um, as a system, we're focused not just on enrollment at parity, though, um, the access problem, but also student success at parity, the, the equity gaps. And that's where we're focusing a lot today. Um, one of our advantages as a fully integrated statewide system of public higher education is that our seven open door community colleges can help students with greater needs. So first generation Native Hawaiian students who never thought they could enroll much less succeed in college because no one in their family showed them the way. Students with financial challenges who may not be able to afford the higher tuition at a research university. Uh, unfortunately, we don't yet have the endowment that Harvard enjoys, but maybe one day. Um, we do have one of the best approaches to transfer in the country, we think, with agreement on uh, general education and an increasing number of degree pathways from the community colleges into our three universities. Um, we've done a lot to leverage federal funding opportunities. Um, uh, the Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian Education Act and Title III to build support structures for Native Hawaiian students and others who may face similar challenges, such as our Pacific Islander students. Um, we now have a Native Hawaiian Student Success Center on each of our 10 campuses where our students can find uh, refuge and support, that um, sense of community and home that President Sinaway talked about uh, on her campus. Um, we have departments of Hawaiian studies and or language. So those are places uh, for the study of their culture and language on every one of our campuses uh, where Hawaiians and others can learn a lot more uh, about Hawaii. In fact, Hawaiian Studies 107 has been one of the largest enrolled courses across the, the University of Hawaii system. Um, and we've also embraced our responsibilities as universities to research and scholarship. So at UH Manoa, we have what I think is the first freestanding College of Indigenous Knowledge um, uh, on a research university campus. Uh, we have emphases in Hawaiian scholarship in many of our departments and colleges now, um, history to science. At UH Hilo, which is a smaller uh, regional campus on Hawaii Island, uh, we've established Kahaka Ula o Ke'eli Kolani, uh, which we think is the only freestanding 
School of Indigenous Language in the United States. And that has a groundbreaking PhD program in Indigenous language revitalization. And we attract students actually from um, Native Americans, uh, Europeans, Asians, uh, New Zealand and Australia, sharing the lessons uh, because our university has really been at the forefront of revitalizing, saving the Hawaiian language from when it was down to a few hundred remaining native speakers in the 1970s to tens of thousands now, including a vibrant and growing system of K-12 immersion schools. Uh, students are routinely graduating with high school diplomas, uh, being completely educated in Hawaiian. And of course the university is educating most of the teachers who are uh, 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 teaching in those schools. So we know we need to show our students models of success who look like them. Um, so let me just acknowledge that one of the areas we're lagging is in recruiting native Hawaiian faculty, especially at our universities where PhDs are a requirement. Um, we continue to improve at that, but let me close with an interesting uh, little tidbit. Uh, we're governed by uh, a board of regents of 11. Right now, four of them are Hawaiian or part Hawaiian. That's over 36% as compared to, as I mentioned, uh, just 22% of our total population. So um, lots of progress. The needles are all moving in the right direction, but a lot more to do. Great, thank you for that. I uh, really appreciate hearing that and the, all, the, all the great work y'all are doing. Jason, I'll come back to you um, and I'm gonna combine uh, your question with a question that came in from the audience uh, from Morgan Taylor. Um, but Jason, we, we know that Native students often face difficulties when navigating a predominantly white institution such as Harvard. Um, so the, the first question was, what advice do you have to other professionals in supporting these students? But I, I think Morgan's question also hints at it. Um, Morgan asked about ensuring data and visibility does not inhibit the ability for predominantly white institutions to serve Native students. So can you just talk to us a little bit about what it means to serve Native students at a predominantly white institution and how we make sure that they're supported in their, in their work and in the data that we collect. Sure. Um, you know, in my dealings with students every day, um, the overwhelming predominant ask of our students is more faculty and more courses, without a doubt. Doesn't matter if we're talking about business students, law students, um, divinity students at Harvard, um, medical students, that is what they all ask for time and time again without hesitation. Um, more faculty and more courses or coursework for them to do the work that they want to do. Um, and then I think very closely following that is more staff. And so I think for, the, for our viewers that are here today, if you are in any hiring capacity, um, I think it would be you know, advantageous for you to hire indigenous staff. And it doesn't have to fall uh, in line with a native or indigenous studies uh, program. Um, I think there are lots of talented native and indigenous people doing lots of wonderful things in, in literature, in English, in STEM fields. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really want to make sure I, I sort of say that for on behalf of our students who really, you know, really want to see as, as Dr. Lassner said, you know, well, they want to see a curriculum that reflects who they are. Um, and so even, you know, for our students here, you know, when they see that Harvard has, you know, an endowment that is just so much money, you know, they say, why not? Why can't we do something like that? Why can't we bring in more professors? Um, in 2018 or 19, we had um, an influx of, of four professors who taught in Native Studies. Um, and it has done wonders for our campus life and our campus community. Um, our students have um, not just one or two classes that they can take every semester. I mean, we're now up to about um, 18 to 20 classes a semester now, which is huge in, in, in our world um, because we just don't have the faculty here that are, that are here. And that's tenured faculty to an obvious point. Um, and then you said that there was a question from one of the um, uh, Q&A. So I wanna make sure I wanna- Yeah, absolutely. Just um, since we're talking about um, supporting Native students at predominantly white institutions, Morgan asked about, ensuring that data and visibility does not inhibit our ability to support Native students on PWIs. I'm just curious about data collection and how we can do that better. Yeah, that's a, it's a very interesting question because of, you know, sort of the, the whole iPads of classification is that, you know, if we get a student who identifies as two or more races, sometimes they don't get reported to our office. Um, and so we have to go back to our, either our student affairs office or our, or our admissions office and say, can you just pull any student who self-identified? Um, and, um, 
And so, you know, I think that's, you know, that's, that's one thing that we have tried to tackle very recently. And just before the pandemic, we wanted to sort of, in, in sort of invoke this sort of indigenous citizenship question in our, um, in our applications. Um, so if you think of a, of a system like UC, the UC system, you know, if you apply to the UC system, you click on a button that's, that where you want to identify as American Indian, and it will drop down like 500, 600 <laughs> options for you to identify as. And I think, you know, for coming from a private institution like that, we see those sort of things. And we, we think there's, there's power in that. Um, there's power in that um, our students want to know, again, the whole community thing. They want to know who else is here that might be Lumbee, that might be Diné, that might be Kanakamale, that might be even First Nations from coming from Canada. Um, so, you know, there, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely lots of room to grow in that area. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, I think it, it, it's, it's somewhat on the part of institutions to say, like, you know, our, our classification students matters um, in ways that, you know, we know that cohorts of Native and Indigenous students are much more successful when it's just one or two. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a definite, definite growth for, I think, American institutions. Yeah, thank you for that, Jason. And I think we're all um, trying to figure that out some, you know, disaggregated student data has really been a hot topic recently, but how do we use it in a way that's supportive of students? Uh, President Sinaway, I want to come back to you. Um, both Jason and Dr. Lassner have, have mentioned some about embedding this history and culture. Um, and that's something that Saginaw Chippewa Tribal College really tries to do um, with bet, abetting that Ashinaabe history and culture into your institution. So um, how, how do you, how does this make a difference compared to other community colleges in terms of embedding that history and culture into your institution? I think that one of the, the primary reasons that um, it's embedded is the comfort level for our students. First of all, when they're coming to a tribal college, when they're coming to this tribal college and they're coming from the community. And as I said, it was an extension, okay? So what they're looking for is they're looking for how do I relate? So when you're going into the classroom and the curriculum is familiar um, and related back to the culture, then I think that that's key in engagement for students. I think the other part of it is that it has to go beyond the classroom and so it's not only the curriculum, but it's also the interaction around the campus. You know, what is that interaction like? What are, what's going on beyond um, the classroom that helps support students? And so you got it, it's, it's more of a holistic approach. And so I think that when our students come here, they're coming with an uncertainty. Um, all of their, majority of them, their experiences with education has been negative. And so we have to create that safe space for them to say, this is going to be okay and support beyond the classroom. So that if their student going through a life situation, it might be impacting their attendance. It might be impacting their academic success. There's, an, there's somebody that understands. There's somebody they can talk to just like in a native family. You've got an elder that you might go to if you're having trouble on our campus. You, we want our faculty and our staff to be able to engage in those students so that they can see them as a support person. So I think that whole embedding on um, the culture, it goes beyond the classroom. It has to go all over campus. It has to be in every office. It has to be a sense of, of um, belonging and in, in encouraging people to belong to our community and being part of our community. And so I think that that's key for tribal colleges is how do you engage those students? How do you give them a sense of belonging? How do you make sure that they're comfortable where they're at? Because they're coming in with a lot of different life problems and this is a chance for them and they might come in thinking I'm never going to make it but if they have one small success, then they're going to be okay. And we have to make sure that we're, we're showing them family and that's part of the culture. And I think that's how we embed it in the campus beyond the classroom. I mean, you can do all kinds of curriculum that will embed native studies or, or whatever, what have you. But I think that the key to the success is that there's, there's the family setting beyond the classroom and those supports that culture is what really is key for tribal colleges. That's great. Uh, thank you so much for that. And yeah, just um, 
embedding that past the past the curriculum that there's so much uh, more to that and uh, that sense of belonging. So I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing. Chancellor Cummings, I will come back to you. Um, I'm gonna combine your question with um, a question that came in from Andrew Saracino. Um, but we oftentimes talk about access uh, and recruitment for indigenous students. Um, but we also know there are several factors that affect uh, persistence, um, such as financial aid and academic preparation. Can you tell us about some of the specific programs uh, UNC Pembroke has um, to help with these factors of persistence? Thanks, Wynn. So I just could not agree more with what Carla just said and, and what the others have said as well in terms of, of, of what it takes to for American Indian students to find success on a on a campus. And we all know that it is unique in many, many ways. And as I've pointed out, one of the one of the uh, um, uh, efforts that we put forth in the last few years is to bring more of the culture, more of what they see at home. Uh, to, to the campus here at UNC Pembroke. We have uh, over a thousand students and they represent over 30 tribes here on campus. We hope to increase that in the years to come. We've, the reference has been made to the importance of numbers and, uh, and uh, in anticipation or preparation for this, I looked up our specific numbers and I'm proud to, to verify, uh, new, but uh, verify that even this year, if you look at the persistent rate of our American Indian students here on campus, uh, the, the retention, freshman to sophomore retention, we're actually about a, a half point below what our overall uh, rate of 74% is, and, and uh, more so in uh, our, our female students than our, our male students. And our graduation rate, likewise, is, has, is, is respectable and is, is in the uh, uh, six year range of about 40%. So we're very proud of that, and but to achieve that, as your as your question indicates, there are many many factors, not just the culture and and what the students find in that sense of community, but as well, uh, finances are a big big important part. Uh, uh, probably sixty, I think it's sixty six percent of our students receive a Pell Grant. Uh, 87 percent receives uh, significant uh, support in order to uh, uh, attend UNC Pembroke. And we make that uh, financial support uh, available in many, many ways. Fortunately, the state of North Carolina actually has a legislated amount of money that comes to each of the 15 universities in the state to support specifically American Indian education, which is somewhat unique, uh, especially in, in a southern town, southern city, southern uh, uh, state. And uh, UNC Pembroke, because we have the majority of the of American Indian students that uh, attend those 15 universities, obviously receive a, we receive a significant amount of that money. We also make available a number of scholarships over the, over the last 135 years. We have a significant number of American Indians who uh, alums who have moved on and been successful in life. And so we've been blessed to have a number of those folks who have come back to give back to students and help them achieve their uh, educational dreams. Uh, we're fortunate to receive significant grant funding. Uh, we are recognized as a Nasante uh, school, which is Native American serving non-tribal institution and uh, much akin somewhat to the tribal colleges and universities, which is more uh, organized and, and longer standing than Nasante's, but it does give us a source of a significant grant funding to in the terms in terms of millions of dollars that uh, we can earmark toward supporting our students. Uh, you know, it's one thing to admit the students, another thing to keep them here and provide an environment situation where they can be successful. So through that uh, grant funding, we're able to support various success uh, 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 pro policies and procedures processes that we can put in place for our students. Academic wise, we uh, collaborate with our uh, sister institutions, uh, Chapel Hill and NC State and University of Charlotte and so forth. They offer a number of graduate programs, which we do not here at UNC Pembroke. So we're, what we've done is we've created what we call pathways to success. Uh, one being to the Brody School of Medicine, which is a direct pathway for our students to become a physician. We have a pathway with NC State's College of Engineering with their uh, School of Veterinary Medicine and uh, with other per many other programs across the, across the system that we're able to bring our students here. We, 
we bring them from various backgrounds and sometimes they come uh, prepared more so than, than, and maybe less prepared in some situations. And we're able to bring them up, get them at that four year degree. And if they want to go on, uh, we wanna make sure that that pathway is there for them and, and that we provide uh, um, success uh, mechanisms for them. The, the, the last program I'll describe is what we call NC Promise, North Carolina Promise, and that is a tuition program specific, specifically to UNC Pembroke and three other universities within the UNC system where uh, the state of North Carolina significantly subsidizes the tuition for out of state as well as in state students. So if you attend UNC Pembroke, your tuition is capped at $500 per semester for eight consecutive or 10 consecutive semesters, which is a savings of $10,000, $12,000, depending on, on what degree you might pursue over what period of time uh, to those students right out of the bat. And then they can apply for Pell uh, support, grant support, scholarship support, and so forth. If you're out of state, it's even actually a better deal. Uh, it basically is capped at $2,500 per semester, which is a savings of $10,000 for the students over each year, 40,000 over four years. So those, we, we provide a significant amount of, of uh, financial support for our students and, and uh, still many still end up working and, and, and doing other things to graduate. But uh, we do a lot to, to make, at least take the financial part out of the picture as much as we can. And then as I say, when they get here to provide that culture that they, uh, need and, and, and perhaps expect. And then if you want to go on after your four years to higher education, a pathway uh, for that as well. That's great. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, the, the pathways to success. And then uh, at the Hunt Institute, we're, we're excited about NC Promise. Uh, some of those, you know, I, we're three years in now. So finally starting to get some real data that we can start to crunch. And, but we've seen uh, anecdotally the effects of that. So thank you for all that work. Um, we are getting close on time, so I think I'll do one or two questions. Um, Jason, I'll bring this one to you and then I'll give others uh, a chance to chime in if uh, they would like. But um, Valerie Welte asked about um, Native students that have moved to an urban area, maybe by themselves, um, without their community. How do we support those students uh, in college and make sure they find that sense of belonging? We've talked a lot about community and family today. So just wanting to touch on those students that maybe take a leap on their own uh, and go to a place that may be more urban without the support systems they're used to. How can we support those Native students? So I think the first thing is, um, and I think tribal colleges and universities do a really good at job, of, job of this, is like they create that family atmosphere. Um, and I think at sort of these sort of PWI institutions, we really kind of focus on a on sort of an individual you know, Harvard is sort of this like pinnacle of like individual excellence. Um, but a lot of native indigenous students come from backgrounds where, you know, it's, it's more about community excellence um, or community connections or community relationships. Um, so for those that might be coming from urban areas or coming from reservation to an urban area, you know, you want to create a family atmosphere. Um, and you want that, like I said before, they wanna see themselves reflected in any aspect of the university. If you have a pre-summer reading list before students arrive on campus, put an indigenous author in there. Um, if you uh, are having a large lecture series, make sure to invite indigenous speakers on campus. Those little things go a long ways to allowing a student to actually feel a connection to their institution. Um, and when you don't have those things, then they feel, obviously they feel disconnected. They don't feel like they um, belong. Um, and they, and, and you know, it, 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 it's like they have separate identities. They have their college institution identity and then they have their sort of home family identity. And in reality, you know, we, could, we can solve both. You know, it's, it's not that hard of a lift um, for institutions to really just put more indigenous content in the everyday campus life and in everyday coursework. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, President Sinaway, I don't know if you wanna add anything to this. Um, I think, I, you know, sometimes we think that if you're, if you're at, you can't create certain environments or communities in certain places, but I think that within mainstream institutions, you know, bringing some of those community senses into that community could be key for not only your native students, but also for those other students that are struggling 
You know, we get non-native students here who aren't making it in mainstream institutions that come here and can and are able to relate and able to be successful. Mm -hmm. So what that tells me is that there are things that those mainstream institutions can do to help those students that are struggling, that not only um, minority students. And so when you want to create an, something of culture or, or a sense of family, you know, I think one of the easiest things might be is food. Um, that's what native today, for instance, we had a beating circle at lunch and I made the fry bread and another fact or another dean, she made corn soup and we just put it out there and said, you know, anybody who wants to eat can eat, you know, and so what do you have, you know, maybe in the community, maybe in your dorms, you have a certain day as a giveaway for something or in the whatever you have on campus, an office is giving something away. Um, an office is doing something to make students know that we recognize you're here. So just acknowledging students on main campus, I think is gonna, would be something that would create that sense of culture and identity and inclusion, so. You're on mute, Wynn. I, I'm on mute, sorry. Uh, I just, thank you for that presence in a way. Uh, I know, man, I've done these webinars for a while and it's first time in a long time I've done it. Uh, President Lasser, I saw you unmute. Just want to give you a chance to respond to this as yeah, well. Yeah, I just wanted to add a brief comment that um, I agree with, you know, all um, Jason presidents in a way. Um, and I'll just note that these last two years have been especially difficult uh, because of COVID-19, um, isolation, virtual environments, requirements to um, uh, study and learn uh, for many at home without a full vibrant campus life. So I think we have a lot of catching up to do to build community in person on all of our campuses, whether tribal or traditional. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we're getting close on time. So Chancellor Cummings, I just wanna give you one chance to, you know, 30 seconds to add any final remarks before I close this out, either related to this or more generally about our topic. No, just generally, I appreciate all that has, as, as an American Indian, all that has been done, is being doing, is been done to further the uh, higher education options for American Indians. I can tell from this, this uh, uh, group that we are all facing some of the same obstacles and challenges, but also opportunities to improve. And just very, very, uh, again, thankful to uh, hear everyone's comments and be a part. Absolutely. Well, we, we certainly appreciate uh, the four panelists taking your time out of your day uh, to be a part of this. We are only scratching the surface on these conversations and look forward to diving to them in more detail. And part of that will include a issue brief that uh, the Hunt Institute is rolling out uh, either later today or tomorrow morning uh, that Jameson Lowry, who did introductions, uh, wrote for us uh, a just an uh, outstanding issue brief looking at supporting Indigenous students across America. Um, but with that, I just want to give us some closing uh, notes. Um, again, thank you for being here uh, for the webinar. Uh, like I said, this is one of our most attended webinars, so there's obviously some interest in this uh, topic and ways we can better grow and support our Indigenous students on campus. Um, on Tuesday, April 19th, we do have another webinar coming up. This is Homerooms. It's Breaking the Partisan Lines, How Leading Education Policy Voices Find Common Ground. Uh, then we'll turn to our race and ed and early efforts is doing a joint um, webinar on neurodiversity and early childhood development, supporting children and parents. And then Tuesday, April 28th, our K-12 uh, series will be back uh, discussing to mask or not to mask, implementing evidence-based unmasking policies in schools. And then we'll be back with our next section of our post-secondary pathways, um, attainment for all using disaggregated data to close equity gaps. And we had some questions about uh, iPads and federal data today and in invisible groups. And so we'll have to make sure uh, we, we capture that as well in that conversation. But again, uh, thank you uh, all our panelists. Thank you for our audience members for being here. Uh, to stay up to date with everything the Hunt Institute is doing, you can follow us at um, Hunt underscore Institute to stay all up to date with our work. Uh, this will be on Facebook as well as YouTube. Uh, so feel free to share it with any of your uh, contacts and let us know if you have any future questions. Uh, but we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to spend it with us and to learn more about how we can support our Indigenous students. Thank you all.